major diplomatic battle looming at the United Nations. The Palestinians now aggressively pushing for formal membership of the organization, but meeting fierce opposition from both Israel and the United States. Is it so much to ask today of Israel to recognize Palestinians' right to statehood on 22% of British mandate Palestine? Salam Fayyad, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, has been working to establish a state for years. While Gaza is still struggling, the West Bank, according to him, is already a state in all but name. Roads are being repaired, schools are being built. Security is more effective and the economic infrastructure stronger, he says. But that hasn't stopped his critics from arguing that Salam Fayyad hasn't done enough to get rid of corruption inside the Palestinian Authority and that he's not really representing the interests of all Palestinians, least of all the people of Gaza. We caught up with the Palestinian Prime Minister in his office in Ramallah and spoke about his opinions on UN membership, recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, and why, just as Palestinian statehood may be closer than ever, he's contemplating leaving office. But we began by asking him about the benefits and the potential risks of pushing for UN membership at this moment. I think this is perfectly legitimate for us to pursue. There's no question about that. I would say it's legitimate for us to pursue and expect from Israel. You know, going back to 1993, we Palestinians, the PLO acting on behalf of all Palestinians in Palestine and diaspora, recognized Israel's right to exist in peace and security. Is it so much to ask today of Israel to recognize Palestinians' right to statehood on 22% of British mandate Palestine? That's when we are talking about Israel. How about the rest of the world? Obviously, it's perfectly legitimate for us to pursue recognition, leading ultimately to membership of the United Nations, because we definitely want to become a member why, of the United Nations. Why do you think that Israel then goes onto the world stage on a regular basis and claims that um, the purpose of Palestine is to wipe Israel off the map? and to get very, very angry about the procedure that's being proposed in the UN. Why, why do you think they're responding that way? You know, I do not know uh, what it is that Israel is angry about when it talks about the procedure that's being followed at the United Nations, when, in fact, uh, we really have not, as of yet, determined exactly what sort of procedure uh, or mechanism we're going to uh, deploy, use, utilize uh, in order to advance our cause. Let me put it this way, because that's still being deliberated. My own assessment uh, of the of the But it's position. not just Israel. The U.S. is now talking in terms of perhaps even cutting their funds yeah. to you, which will put you that even more crisis. Yeah, yeah, that, that, well, you know, this has been described in many ways, in many terms, as a cause of concern. First argument against it that was used, it here is yet to be defined, by the way. Uh, exactly what is it that uh, there is this much anxiety about is yet to be defined. I really have to make this uh, absolutely clear and still being deliberated. But uh, first, I mean, uh, uh, concern, I mean, wh when concern was expressed first about this vis-a-vis -vis our intentions, it was uh, uh, unilateralism, uh, under the heading of unilateralism, that Palestinians are going it alone. Uh, but I think this is a contradiction in terms. Uh, you go to the United Nations where uh, all of humanity uh, is there, uh, all m members of the uh, all uh, community of nations are there and, and, and wanting to become a, a member of that whole family and you're accused of being a unilateralist. I mean, that just does, does not stand. But then uh, this was uh, framed later, uh, later on uh, in, in terms of uh, seeking membership uh, at the United Nations uh, unilaterally, uh, ditching uh, uh, negotiations or, or political process. Now, exactly how is that going to happen? Let, let's say, let us say, for the sake of argument now, we go to the United Nations, and let's say, let's assume that we seek full membership of the United Nations, and let's say, yes, we go as the procedures would require to the Security Council, and let us assume uh, that we get 15 uh, yes votes, the Security Council, and that is sent to the Secu to General Assembly, certified by General Assembly. Let's assume for the sake of argument. Okay. Now, isn't this? Isn't this what two-state solution is supposed to be about? What kind of state, wh what kind of state would the world be recognizing? State along the 1967 borders or lines, if you will, on 22% of British mandate Palestine. This is the embodiment of the two-state solution that Israel or the government of Israel asserts having accepted. Now, why, is, why should that be viewed as a threat? Why should Israel not be a part of that consensus? So you presumably were 
quite angry with Benjamin Netanyahu's interview on Arabic television only a few days ago, I actually in which he presented it. himself as a, as a man sitting there with open arms in his home, waiting for a partner for negotiations. Well, uh, delays uh, and lack of progress oftentimes were attributed to lack of partner uh, or partnership uh, or adequate partner on the Palestinian side. Uh, but I think the, the record should be uh, examined. I think. Uh, so, I so, when, so when Benjamin Netanyahu said, and, yeah, I, and I'll quote yeah, him to yeah. you, when he sat there and said, yes, I'll be willing to negotiate on 67 borders with exclusions. Yes, um, I'd be willing to talk about every issue that the Palestinians want to talk about. They only have to call me. You, you don't think he was being honest? I think a lot of this is reflexive, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't like generally to get into the business of speculating on, on intentions and all, and it's pointless. All I can tell you, my own sense of his position on this, uh, uh, what, what it is that we've been trying to do, and also on projecting himself as ready to go if only we were to show up, uh, on the former, I think it's been reflexive, uh, highly reflexive. It's not enough to say we're ready to negotiate, but question that we have on what basis. Negotiations ought not be about principles. Right. Negotiations must be, should be, and can only be about arrangements, about assurances, but not about principles. What we're looking for is a state of our own on 22% of uh, British mandate Palestine. We can't get to negotiations with Mr. Netanyahu <coughs> saying, well, uh, but we have overriding security uh, considerations that would require uh, Israeli army presence in the Jordan Valley, let's say. So you're saying that he uh, is actually obfuscating while pretending to be a partner for peace. Do you think that there is a partner for peace on the Israeli side at all? Uh, you know, when we get uh, a statement uh, that says there is willingness on the part of the Israeli government to negotiate on the basis of the agreed original terms of reference of this political process, as agreed between the parties going back to 1993, with all relevant uh, resolutions of the body of international law, I think that's when we begin to believe uh, that, in fact, we could go somewhere. But if the talk continues to be uh, uh, focused on, well, let's just get together. We've been getting together uh, you know, for a number of years. Look at what's happened. Erosion, more settlement activity, more expropriation of land, uh, more change of character in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, all of which, none of which, uh, you know, tells of uh, near end to the occupation or desire on the part of the occupying power that is Israel to relinquish the occupation. That's really our basic fundamental problem. Another problem is, what is it exactly that, in, you know, even those uh, who are progressive uh, relative to others on this question of Palestinian statehood, what is really important to ask them uh, is not so much whether or not they support two-state solution uh, or emergence of state of Palestine. What is important, particularly this late in the game, is to ask them, what is it that they really actually have in mind by way of state when they say a Palestinian state? A, a real state on 22% of British mandate Palestine or a Mickey Mouse state of leftovers? That's very important. That's the, the deep concern that we have. Uh, you know, including vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what uh, Bibi Netanyahu says when he says Palestinian state. One of the other elements that Benjamin Netanyahu mentioned was that, he, as far as he's concerned, there are no preconditions that um, recognition of the Palestinian state, which at some point seemed to be, as a big part of the Israeli state, at some point seemed to be one of his preconditions. He seems to suggest it no longer is. But this demand that the, the Jewishness of the state of Israel be recognized and be legitimated, in his words, seems to be a fairly new one and, and, and a fairly strong precondition, doesn't it? It is new uh, and it is strong. It was not part of the original terms of reference. Uh, as a matter of fact, going back to 1993 and the famous declaration of mutual recognition, uh, which consists of two elements. One relates to recognition uh, by the PLO acting on behalf of all Palestinians. And this is verbatim of Israel's right to exist in peace and security. That's, uh, if there is such a thing as gold standard, as I often say in the word of recognition, this is it. Because uh, countries recognize each other without really getting into this business of recognizing each other, other's right to exist. Yet that was the formulation. It's a very, very strong formulation if you really think about it. Israel's right to exist in peace and security. 
And it was a formulation that the government of Israel was happy with uh, and accepted to sign that declaration which which a recognition on the basis of it when it happened. What is important is to note, number one, what is the other side of declaration? What is that second element to make a declaration of mutual recognition? It's Israel's recognition of the PLO as a representative of Palestinian people. In other words, here we are, going back to 1993, original terms of reference. We recognize Israel's right to exist in peace and security in return for Israel not recognizing our right to statehood, but recognizing the right of the PLO to, to represent us, which, of course, if you think about it, was necessary from Israel's point of view to validate that recognition by the PLO of Israel's right to exist in peace and security. This is number one. If you really think about that uh, phraseology of uh, recognition of Israel's right to exist in peace and security, it's very, very strong. Why? Rec recognition of Israel's right to exist, Israel's right to exist, doesn't really get into Israel's character. It's Israel's right to exist, but then in peace and security. Very strong formulation in a legal sense, not only political sense, because in some sense, Israel can argue, not only politically, as a matter of fact, but even legally, against the emergence of state of Palestine, if it can adequately represent that emergence of state of Palestine would pose a security threat to its existence. This is how strong the recognition the Israelis got out of us going back to 1993. So yes, I mean, this is new. But yeah, now they say that, that Hama Hamas hasn't given that recognition. Ha Hamas has not, but Hamas is a faction. And the PLO, when it did, did so acting on behalf of all Palestinians and was so recognized and continues to be so recognized by the state of Israel. In fact, I personally argue that it was in Israel's interest to recognize the PLO as having that capacity in order to validate the PLO's recognition of Israel's right to exist in peace and security. So Israel has got the, the, the gold standard uh, uh, in, in, in the world of recognition. So, so now he's added this extra element of not only its right to exist, but its right to exist as a Jewish state. And they're now talking about delegitimization yeah. every time everyone leaves that formulation out. Is that so much to give? I mean, does it does it matter one way or another if you've given it the right to exist? Is the Jewish state something that you can by add the way, to? By the way, we're, we're not alone in having problems with that. I mean, there are issues, you know, related with, you know, throwing this now and adding it to the terms of reference, uh, issues not unrelated to the fate of negotiations on another permanent status issue, and that is refugees. Uh, there's also the question of when you talk about the character of the state in, in, in this sense, question of uh, Palestinian Arabs who live in the state of Israel. There are all of these issues. Uh, now, there is not, I don't believe, consensus even in Israel on making this the demand that Mr. Netanyahu has been making it to be. Uh, I've heard uh, some serious Israeli politicians argue, I think cogently, uh, that this is really not something that we should be pursuing. Uh, why would any country in the world be looking for recognition of uh, a neighbor or any other country, of, uh, of, uh, for that matter, of a, a certain attribute of its? That, that's a choice of uh, a sovereign choice of, of countries themselves, subject to their own political processes and subject to how they project themselves, uh, if they're projecting themselves as uh, uh, pluralistic democracies and all of that, that, that comes with certain requirements that should be respected. But in terms of attributes of the state and all of those things, I mean, there isn't really anything uh, that exists today, or I believe, I don't know if uh, anything like this has ever existed. In any event, I don't think I'm alone arguing this. Uh, there are ser serious voices within, within Israel who really take issue with making this an issue. Uh, in addition to it, of course, uh, being a new demand, uh, and a substantive change relative to everything that existed, particularly when juxtaposed, uh, you know, next to that very clear, unequivocal, uh, open-ended, very strong recognition that we gave to Israel going back to 1993. Now, you talked about strong leadership in Israel. What about the leadership on this side of the table? Um, the recent deal with Hamas, many people still find unconvincing. Your relationship with Mahmoud Abbas, in many ways, is unexplained, uh, and you have had differences before. How is that going to resolve itself? And, and as a secondary element of that, do you, do you think that the divisions within your organizations are any greater or lesser than the divisions within the Israeli parliament? 
Yeah, I, I guess each society has its own share uh, of, of political problems, and you know, Palestine is not unique in this sense, uh, except that we really have major challenge of ending the occupation that makes it especially difficult. Uh, yeah, ours is not really an easy situation. Uh, I'll leave it to Israeli officials to characterize their own uh, political. No, but what, what, we, what we hear mostly is yeah. how divided and yeah, angry look, your organizations are. We, I'm just wondering if that's a fair characterization, we, or do you think these differences are surmountable? Look, there have been, uh, first, I do not you know, grant the part that you said in terms of my relationship with the president, but that, that just, uh, you know, I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, I, I've been uh, serving as his prime minister since uh, mid-2007. Uh, and as you know, uh, when it came time to uh, naming prime minister for this unity government, uh, he time and again uh, said that I was uh, his only candidate for the job. And uh, this does not speak of the a relationship that is not right. But you yourself have su suggested that you might not uh, might want to keep might not that, want to keep the matter. job. Yeah, that well, it, it doesn't really mean. I mean, uh, that, that wasn't a as a consequence of conflict. Th of opinion. Does it doesn't mean that you have full agreement on the exact detail of every element, every item that is there uh, on, on the table for discussion or consideration. And this may be one of them. But going back to uh, the fracture within Palestinian society, political society, yes, it exists. It's deep, uh, and it's fundamental. Uh, it predates. Uh, the violent takeover of power by Hamas in Gaza and the separation that ensued. Uh, it goes back to, uh, I believe, uh, in, in uh, modern era uh, to 1993, to the Oslo Accords, to the fact that there were those who supported the Oslo Accords, there were those who to this day don't. Uh, some actually who were within the factions of PLO uh, uh, didn't uh, accept the, the, the Oslo Accord. Uh, in more recent years, uh, Hamas gained uh, uh, power and strength, uh, gradually culminating in a major electoral win uh, by them and for them in uh, January 2006. Uh, be they became major political power, and they oppose uh, Oslo Accords. There are other factions that oppose o Oslo Accords. So that, you know, on, on key issues uh, related to uh, the very framework that created the Palestinian Authority, there are serious differences within Palestinian political society, and that definitely is a major complication. But I would say, politically, I mean, the political side of this is, is understandable. I would say even more than understandable. It, it doesn't, you know, I find it natural. I mean, to expect that all of us Palestinians would converge uh, on, on something like this, when convergence is not expected of any other country or political society is expecting too much, uh, to be honest with you. So. The issue for me is not really so much that we have different views, sometimes sharply different views on, on political issues, but failure to really manage those differences, failure to prioritize, failure of asking basic questions. What is it that we need minimally in order for us to be able to govern ourselves effectively? Uh, there was not agreement, for example, on the important role of security. Security wrongly since inception of Palestinian Authority was viewed as if it were only an Israeli interest. And I would say wrongly uh, and disastrously from our point of view. Security is as much a Palestinian need as an Israeli one. It never was addressed in the way that it has been since mid-2007 here in the West Bank. Unfortunately, because of the separation, that did not cover Gaza. But it's important for us to agree on such practical important issues like security. Lack of agreement is a serious source of concern for us. I thought that the reconciliation uh, agreement that was uh, reached in April of, of this year uh, and signed in April of this year was a, a hopeful sign. Now, it has not materialized in the sense of implementation. I still am hopeful that it will be possible to really begin to take concrete steps toward uh, reunifying the country. It's an absolute must, and I'm a firm believer in it. As we get to the end of your self-imposed two-year deadline, yes. and as we get to a time when um, the Hamas Fatah split is still not fully healed. The question has to be asked, is this an appropriate time for you to move aside and let somebody else manage that next stage of the process? Yeah, I, I would have absolutely no problem with that. I think it's only natural, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the thing that I lament the most uh, is the fact that we've been governing and doing things uh, without a functional legislature. Uh, story is not complete. You so know, is, that, is that what you plan to do then? Yeah, I definitely would wish to really find the right opportunity to do this. Uh, and, and I believe uh, uh, things moving in that direction would be only natural. I've been doing this for four years. 
uh, without the functional legislature. Uh, what is really important for us is to achieve unity and to have a functional legislature and to have active political life and prepare for the next elections. So we begin to really have those with regularity. That's really what's important. That's what has been missing. So yes, I'm definitely uh, most prepared to step down uh, at a moment's notice, for certain. Would you offer your resignation? I, or I, do you plan to offer your I, resignation? I have. As a matter of fact, the government that I now had is a caretaker government. We, uh, we, we have resigned several months ago. And we were in the process of putting together another government when that agreement was signed by the major factions, by the factions, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, first in April, then... Th then, uh, then I need to rephrase the question. Yes. Will you stand again? Well, uh, I never really considered myself a candidate for the uh, premiership of the unity government. What happened after the factions was agreed, uh, after, uh, after the factions uh, agreed, uh, the first practical step toward implementing that agreement was to put together a unity government. Uh, I did not think that I would uh, be considered for it, uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, given that, uh, you know, I became prime minister in the aftermath of the, uh, uh, the separation. Uh, we certainly uh, did not cause it. We are the result of it. Uh, we did the best we could under extremely difficult conditions, but I definitely was expecting to move on. Uh, except that uh, you know, my name was, was mentioned. Uh, what I find, find gratifying, although by no means uh, am I really using it as a point of saying, uh, you know, I should be the one doing it, is the extent of uh, popular support for, uh, uh, for me out there uh, doing this, based on all opinion polls taken from extreme right to extreme left. But that is not to say to you that I'm, that I'm looking uh, toward or I'm looking to keep this job or I would offer my candidacy for the job. My name was mentioned. It is there, but I definitely, so far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm prepared to step down and move out of consideration at the moment, no, moment notice for certain. But I guess one element that I really did want to, to mention, and it, maybe I should just ask you that now, is how the politics ultimately does end up here. because. The, if, if, the, if the aim is towards ending the occupation as, yeah. a, as, a, as the broad principle, and if the aim is to create a state in which the Palestinians are happy to come back and comfortable to come back, yes, as you say, one of the elements that will tempt them back is, is the idea that it's safe, that, it's, uh, that yeah. there is work, that there is stuff to be done. But is there not also an emotional element to this? Isn't there not also a desire at some point to, if not have retribution, then at least have some sense that their grievances have been answered on an emotional level, even to the merest degree. We all felt this possession, uh, various uh, varying degrees, but we all felt it. And we know what it means uh, to be dispossessed uh, without uh, a country that you can call home. Uh, to me, uh, before it is to anyone else, it's deeply emotional. I can tell you, I mean, that is an overriding uh, consideration. So how do you address that? Uh, well, you use it. I mean, you use that energy in, in the most positive of ways. Uh, you know, when you, when you build, uh, when you introduce improvements in, in your system of government and, and all, if you are in... in but what in, about in the guys sitting in the refugee camps yeah, waiting yeah, well, to What I'm on? really saying to you, you know, when you do all of these things to try to really advance the cause, uh, to build, it, it means when you achieve any degree of progress, it means a lot to you, but it means especially uh, a lot to you if you're Palestinian because it brings you closer to that closure that you're talking about, to uh, you know, get into the point of, uh, of, of feeling, well, uh, you know, we're home. We, we did what we could, and, and here we are. We were able to uh, uh, live as free people. Uh, and that, that's, that's, uh, that's emotional. Uh, you know, it, it, it never ceases to be an emotional issue. I mean, I can just about people sometimes uh, you know, wonder about this, and I really do. Uh, when we introduce some improvement, then, uh, it's a little technocratic stuff uh, here or there, a plan produced, or just a small adjustment to work process that makes the system more efficient and all. Uh, there's a moment there when, when we're, you're talking to staff, people, colleagues and all, uh, when you cannot really, uh, I can't help uh, but, but be overcome by strong sense of emotion, uh, to the point of having tears in my eyes uh, when I think in those terms. Really, I experience it, I live it, uh, because with it, uh, I always felt that each step that we take toward building and improving, we get closer uh, to that rendezvous with freedom. Prime Minister, thank you. My pleasure.
Thank you.